Evangelism is not for the weak, all right? I should know. I wrote a whole book about it, self-published. Most Christians, they are just good for bake sales and potluck dinners. But I'm telling you this right now. It takes a lot of moxie to grab a non-believer by the shirt collar and throw him in the front doors of a church and say, Hey, try living out your heathen life in front of a holy God that way. It is like holy water on a vampire. That's divine intervention, my friend. Repent for the kingdom of the Lord is nigh. Come to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, sir, it sounds like you're really passionate about Jesus. I am. Um, and you should also be Okay. passionate about the Lord. Sir, if there's... You need to get sanctified or chicken fried. Can we... You need to get with the Lord or drive a Ford. Sir, we... Get right or get left. I share my faith. Okay, that's a lie. People don't even know I'm a Christian. I want to, again, another lie. I hardly shower, much less have the will to do anything else. Mm, okay, now if there was pizza and ice cream every time there was faith sharing, I'd do it. That's a lie, I'm lactose intolerant. Again, another lie, I'm just too cheap to buy dairy. Bottom line, sharing my faith makes me sweaty. Uh, tip number 95, um, use big church words like transubstantiation. Heathens get confused easily, and the more confused they are, the more shame they are. The more shame they are, the more apt they are to make a decision for Jesus Christ. I believe it's a responsibility, no, the privilege, no, the glorious privilege of every believer to share their faith with others. That's why I share my faith with everyone I come in contact with. Everyone, really? <laughs> yeah, everyone. How do you do that? Uh, check out my shirt. Can't read it? Try this glove. Not working for you? How about this bracelet? No comprendo? Vistazo a estos. <laughs> Driving behind me? Read my bumper sticker. Says, it's okay if you follow close. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> oh, you're my waiter or waitress? I got a tip for you. Surprise! It's the gospel. I mean, what do you want? Money or eternity? <laughs> I also use these tracks. <laughs> so, what about talking to people about your faith? I, I don't really like people, but I love Jesus. <laughs> Scripture mint? Hi, my name is George. And I'm Jorge, and together we're George and Jorge. Right, right. Uh, what we like to do is to take secular songs and reprogram them. Yes, the purpose is for evangelism. We like to take songs to the unbelieving world and make it believable. Right, right. Let us give you a sample right now. You tick. What is it? You're headed to H-E double hockey sticks. Hey, lost sinner, why don't you just give it all up to Jesus? Tonight, pray for your soul today, for your soul today, just pray. I was a freshman in college, the first time I invited someone to church. My best buddy called me. I was working at a grocery store. I was in the back cutting carrots, and my buddy called me. And I just said, hey, do you want to go to church with me tonight? And uh, I remember his words. He said, sure, I got nothing better to do. And I went to church with him. And you know, I went there because they were serving pizza that night. Um, I don't remember what was said. I don't remember what was sung. During the services, I remember praying for him and just asking God to please reach out and touch his heart or do something because I knew he needed Jesus. And then um, God answered my prayers. That night changed my life, September 17th, 1987. It changed my life because I realized I needed a savior. Well, good morning, Ole, Pennsylvania, and those watching online. If we could, as we start, if we could have you guys kind of move into the two center sections, we'd really appreciate that. Um, I always start off by talking about my last name because Sunshine is kind of an unusual last name. When we used to have phone books, we were the only one in the phone book wherever we lived. And so I've, there are times I haven't even gotten up in front of people yet, and the pastor says, he's got a really strange name. We need to figure out where it came from. So I'll tell you. My grandfather was an Orthodox Jew in Germany in the early 1900s. His name was Harry Zunenschein. And Harry went to Oxford University in England to get a degree. And as he was graduating, they said, Harry, what are your plans for the future? He said, I have a sponsor, and I'm going to emigrate to America. 
They said, well, if you're going to go to America, you probably ought to have an English-sounding name. Does Sonnenschein mean something in English? He said, well, yeah, if you translate it directly, it means sunshine. They said, what a cool name. Call yourself Harry Sunshine. So it was a great name when I was in sales, because when you're in sales, you want people to remember your name. But even sometimes with a simple name like Sunshine, people don't get it. I worked at this little computer store in northern New Jersey in the early 1980s, and I was walking past the reception area. Her name was Jane. And I walked behind her and I heard her say, hold on. And she put the phone down. She burst out laughing and she yells, Don, Don. I said, Jane, I'm right behind you. You don't need to yell. She said, I think this phone calls for you. I said, what do you mean you think? She said, well, they asked for Mr. Sunrise, told him we didn't have anybody here by that name. And they said, how about Moonshine? And she says, no, but I know who you need to speak with. Now, prior to that, though, I was a police officer in New Jersey and I was on a SWAT team. And trust me, it wasn't a good name for a cop. I mean, Officer Sunshine... Kind of sounds like a cartoon character, you know, or a bicycle safety guy or something like that, but it's a great name. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to ride motorcycles. This is a picture of me on my last bike, and for some reason, this kind of looks like a police bike. You know, it's white and it's blue. I got a white helmet with a coiled cord and a microphone, and uh, people think I'm a cop. I'm driving up from Jupiter, Florida, did a MAD training down there, driving up 95 in the right lane, going to Daytona Bike Week to minister to the bikers. And I look in my mirror and there's a car flying up the middle lane really fast. And as it gets close, the whole front end dips down because they slammed on the brakes and they're like looking at me. They're like checking me out, trying to figure out is it safe to pass this guy. And after a couple of minutes, they finally said, no, nah, I think it's okay, and off they went. I was in Cooperstown, New York, pulled off to the side of the road, and I stopped. And this man in a Chevy Suburban pulls up, rolls the window down, he says, excuse me, officer, is it okay to park here if I want to fish in the lake? I said, I'm not a cop, and I'm not from New York. He said, really? You look like one. People will stop and ask for directions. All kinds of crazy things happen, so I thought, you know what? You can have a little bit of fun with this. All you need to do is grab your wife's hair dryer, park yourself out on a road someplace, and you get all kinds of really cool reactions. My wife said to me, where are you going with my hair dryer? <laughs> we had a good time with it. Anyway, this training is recommended and endorsed by a group called the Pocket Testament League. They have tremendous tools that will help you to share your faith, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But here's a question. What are my qualifications? Whenever you have somebody come and speak, you want to know who is this guy and why should I listen to him? So the question comes up, is he ordained? No, I am not ordained. Uh, does he have a seminary degree? Don't have that either. Please tell me at least he's got a Bible college degree. Sorry, I don't have that either. I am just an average guy, a lay person like most of you sitting here. God has taught me this. I put it into practice in my life. It's part of my lifestyle of who I am now. And it's helped change my life and thousands of people's lives I get the privilege of sharing this with. You don't have to be a minister to be able to do this. It's that easy. So here's the question. How would your life change if every day you could naturally and easily, without fear or embarrassment, share your faith with one person? Think about it. That means on Sunday you're going to have a minimum of seven testimonies if you left your house. What if on some days it wasn't one person you got to share with, it was two people, or three or five or seven people? It's a whole lot easier to do than you think. We're going to do three parts today. The first part is how do I recognize the opportunities that God gives me every day to share my faith, but I miss them? And what does it really mean to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ? Then we're going to talk about fear. We're going to list every single fear that we can think of that keeps us from sharing our faith. And I'm going to show you how to beat the fear. And lastly, we're going to talk about what does it look like when a door opens for me to share and what do I do and say when the door opens. Now, you should all have handouts. Anybody slip in without a handout? All right, good. If you're an obsessive compulsive person and you have flipped through the handouts, you're freaking out because there's all these blanks that need to be filled in. Don't worry about it. Anytime you see something on the screen that's in yellow and it's all capitalized and it's underlined, it's a clue. It goes on your paper. So if you follow those instructions, you'll have all the blanks filled in. You'll have a great resource to refer, refer back to. Now, if you're online watching, you can go to my website, donsunshine.org, and the handout is there in PDF format. You can download that. Uh, audience participation time, there is no role playing, so everybody can rest easy. I'm not going to ask anybody to get up and do anything in front of someone. But when I was building this training, I had these informal questions. Like I would say, where do you live? Anybody panicked about that one? Pretty easy, right? And then I have these videos that, uh, video or pictures that I have questions re referring to, and I call that audience participation time. Now, I built this training when I was working up at Family Life as the Youth Action Director, and the morning show producer on the radio was a young guy named Tim. He took the training twice, and after the second time, he said, Don, I know you're still building this training. I'd like to make a suggestion to improve it. I said, go ahead, Tim, I'm open. He said, when you have those spinning letters, and it says it's audience participation time, there's silence. You need some music to go along with that. 
I'm a music guy. I put together a couple samples for you. I said, great, let me hear them. He played the first one, absolutely horrible. And I said, sorry, Tim, I won't be using that. He played me the second one. I just kind of looked at him. He said, Don, I know it's cheesy, but it's so cheesy it's funny. You have to use it. So I've been using it ever since. So when you hear the cheesy music and the letters spin, get ready. It's your turn to participate. Okay, here we go. You were created by God and left on planet Earth to go mad. Our first fill in the blank. That doesn't mean crazy or insane. It means to make a difference. And there's all kinds of differences that we can make in people's lives. But I'll tell you this. The biggest difference you can ever make is to take someone to heaven with you. And if you haven't been used yet by the God of the universe to change someone's eternal address, you don't know what you're missing because it energizes your entire Christian experience, that excitement, that joy that you had when you first came to faith in Christ. You can live out every day as an adventure. And that's what God designed our lives to be, but yet most of us miss it. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a risk when, when you leave here. And I don't like, we don't like to take risks in church settings. We'll find an area of service that we're comfortable with, and we'll do that all day long as long as the pastor taps us and asks us to do that. But if something new comes up that we've never done before, I think a lot of us get really nervous and go, oh, you know what, that's not really my gifted area. Um, why don't you ask so-and-so? They'd be better at this than me. And if they don't want to do it, maybe I'll consider it. We can't be all God wants us to be if we're not willing to come out of our comfort zones and try something. And I'm going to encourage you to try this because it's so easy. We have testimonies from parents of seven-year-olds that put this into practice. Now, who knows what this is? Titanic, right. I was in upstate New York about four years ago, had a group about this size, and I asked this question. No one knew what it was. And that's kind of never happened before. And I said, come on, folks. Nobody knows what this is. And a guy in the back of the room kind of went, a boat? It's like, yeah, right, a boat. Uh, probably the most famous boat of all time. It was launched and sunk 102 years ago, built by a British ocean liner company called the White Star Lines. It took 10,000 men three years and three million rivets just to build the hull and the infrastructure of the ship. And they wanted to build several more of these vessels, so their strategy is to get people on our ships, we're going to set a world record traveling from England to New York. So they approached one of their employees, whose name was E.J. Smith, and they said, EJ, come on down to the docks. We want to show you what we're building and show you the plans. And EJ looked at it and he said, wow, there's never been a ship like this built in all of history. They said, that's right, and you get to pilot it across the North Atlantic and set a world record in the process. He said, guys, that's where I need to stop you. The ship's not even done yet. I wasn't going to take any more long voyages. I was planning on retiring. And they said, EJ, you're the best in the world at doing this. We don't want to entrust this ship to anybody but you. Pardon the pun, but we'll throw a boatload of money at you as a bonus for your retirement, and you'll be world famous if you take this voyage. So he thought about it, and he said, okay, I'll do it. So the ship is being loaded with passengers and cargo. There's a huge throng of people there, and the newspaper people are there talking to the builder. And the builder made an incredibly bold and stupid statement to the newspaper people. Who knows what he said? Not even God could sink this ship. They were arrogant enough that they made up a plaque that said that and hung it above the wheel on the ship. Well, it didn't take God very long. The ship is being put out in iceberg season. Titanic received a total of 21 iceberg warnings. 19 of them made it from the radio room up to the bridge, but they weren't terribly concerned because the ship was unsinkable, right? So they altered their course a little south and continued west. For the entire voyage of the Titanic, the seas were unusually calm. In fact, the reports say they were as calm as a pond. Very significant, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But as they were traveling across, Captain Smith got a visit from the president of White Star Lines. He said, Captain, how fast are we going? He said, we are at a world record pace. We will arrive on schedule on Wednesday in New York and set a world record in the process. They said, but how fast are we going relative to the capability of the ship? He said, about half to two-thirds speed. He said, listen, I want you to put the pedal down. And he said, sir, with all due respect, he says, I'm the captain. I would really prefer to break the engines in right. He said, no, captain, you don't understand. If we arrive on Tuesday when they expect us to set a world record on Wednesday, we're going to get tremendous press. Everyone's going to want to be on our ships. I insist put the pedal down. He said, hey, it's your ship. So they are screaming across the North Atlantic for the time. That night up in the crow's nest up here in the bow of the ship were two men named Fleet and Lee. Fleet and Lee's jobs were to look for icebergs. However, someone on a previous shift had misplaced the binoculars. So they had no binoculars. So they're standing up there trying to keep warm at night, staring out at the black Atlantic Ocean. And had the seas been as rough as they normally were, Fleet and Lee would have seen waves crashing against the iceberg that was above the surface. Because it was 82 feet above the surface, 262 feet wide. 
but they didn't see it till they're right on top of it. I think Fleet's eyes got real big. He grabbed this big brass belly, starts frantically ringing it, picks up the phone and screams, Iceberg dead ahead, turn hard port, turn hard port. They're trying to throw the ship in reverse and make a hard left-hand turn, and they almost succeeded. They just sideswiped the iceberg. I read reports from people who were below decks that said they barely felt the ship shudder. It was a slight vibration, and it went away. Most people didn't know anything bad had happened. However, the people who were down here knew something really bad had happened. Because Titanic's hull was composed of 16 watertight compartments, and it was designed to stay afloat if four of the forward watertight compartments filled with water. The weight of that iceberg pressing against the hull caused the seam to open up across six watertight compartments and the water poured in. Captain Smith is getting frantic calls on the bridge. He calls the builder says, come on, we got to go below decks and survey some damage. Something happened. They go down and they survey the damage and I think the blood drained out of the builder's face and he looked at Captain Smith. He said, Captain, you've got 60 to perhaps 90 minutes to get everyone in this ship in lifeboats because it's sinking. And Captain Smith is like, no way. This is my last voyage before I'm retiring. I waited for this, this voyage. I've never been on a ship that sunk. It's unsinkable. It can't be sinking. He said, sir, it's going to flounder. You need to get busy. Captain Smith did the math in his head, and he knew he had more lifeboats than were required by law. They could have put a lot more lifeboats on the ship, but they didn't think it looked pretty, and they weren't going to need them anyway. And he knew that if he filled every single lifeboat to capacity, 1,000 people were going to die that night. So he gives the orders, women and children first. If you were a 15-year-old boy, you were considered a man, you weren't allowed in the lifeboat. They hadn't practiced lifeboat drills. So they didn't do a very good job of filling the lifeboats. Almost every single lifeboat was launched less than half full. I read reports from people who were in lifeboats that were launched with 12 people in them that had a capacity of 40 people. So imagine, you're one of the lucky few who gets into a lifeboat. You're lowered onto a very calm North Atlantic. There's a mate assigned to your boat, and he says, okay, everyone, put your oars in the water and start rowing backwards. And you start rowing backwards. And you kind of coast to a stop, and you do a little math and say, listen, pal, I don't want to be rude or anything, but I'm counting 28 free seats in this lifeboat. My husband's on that ship. My 16-year-old son's on that ship. My best friend's on that ship. Why can't we go back and get him? That's still going to leave us 25 free seats. He said, we're not going back for anybody. Put your oars in the water and keep rowing and you row further away. You kind of coast to a stop as the ship starts to fill with water. And then the nightmare of nightmares unfolds. As this ship fills with water, the stern comes up out of the water, pretty much like you saw in the movie. People were sliding down the decks. They were bouncing off of things. They originally thought it went somewhere between 45 and 90 degrees, but recent computer simulations estimate it broke at 38 degrees. So you hear the deafening sound of water pressure ripping steel and wood in half. I think if you plugged your fingers in your ears, it was painful. And this gigantic ship disappears below the surface in two pieces as if it had never existed. And 328 people survived the sinking of the ship, and they are very much alive in the freezing cold 28 degree salt water. And they are screaming, begging the people in the lifeboats to come back for them. Only two lifeboats went back, rescued a total of six people. So 322 people are going to freeze to death in minutes because no one cares enough to go back for them. Imagine sitting in a lifeboat with 28 free seats. You hear this roar of people begging you to come back, and very quickly the voices start to quiet and die, literally. And then there's that one last voice that's holding out, and then that voice is silenced, and you're left with, pardon the pun, dead silence on the water, and you've got 28 free seats in your lifeboat. The people in the lifeboats didn't say anything to each other the rest of the night. Early the next morning, a ship called the Carpathia comes. They rescue everyone who's in lifeboats, and they retrieve as many bodies as they can find out of, the, out of the freezing cold North Atlantic, and they're frozen solid. They give you a stateroom, and they give you a change of clothes, and you get to take a hot shower, and then you have to stand in front of a mirror and look yourself in the eyes. How do you feel? knowing you did absolutely nothing and you could have done something. Sadly, I know for a fact there were a number of people that couldn't live with the guilt over what happened and they committed suicide. The rest of them probably had nightmares for the rest of their lives. I mean, how do you live with yourself knowing you did absolutely nothing and you could have done something? 
Sadly, that's a picture of the church in America today. Those of us who know Jesus Christ, we are safe and secure in God's eternal lifeboats. And he's placed each of us in a sea of lost and dying people. They're not screaming because most of them don't even know they're lost. And we're not going back for them because we're content to have lifeboat parties with everyone who's already saved. We've got small groups and fellowship dinners and Sunday school picnics and Bible studies. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But what about these people that God has placed in our lives that he expects us to go back for? You know, we have this bad definition of evangelism because we believe the lies of the devil. He puts these thoughts in our head, and we believe them that we're only successful if the person says, yeah, I want to come in the lifeboat with you. When in reality, we can't cause the growth no matter what we do because the Bible said Paul planted, Apollos watered, but only God can cause the growth. And all God expects us to do as his followers is so simple. It's just to say, hey, listen, pal, I care about you. And if you stay where you are, you're going to die. Why don't you come in the lifeboat with me? Here's how you can get in. And if you just do that, leave the results to God, you are 100% successful. So here's the question. How many people have you personally cared enough about that you went back for them in the past year and invited them to go to heaven? Leave the results to God. How many people? How about in the past two years, how many people? Or the past five or ten years or more? Sadly, a lot of us are thinking really small numbers, and that needs to change. Because if we look at why Jesus came, the scripture says there's one reason he traded a throne in heaven for a Roman cross. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and that's what my master did, and the Bible says I'm a slave to Christ, that's exactly what I should be doing, but we're not doing it. Statistics say that 9 out of 10 people who profess to be Bible-believing Christians never share their faith with anyone. Jesus himself said, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And yet, for some reason, we're not doing that. David Platt, in his book, Follow Me, says this, Disciples of Jesus can't help but make disciples of all nations. If we truly believe Jesus' words and know Jesus' worth, then we are compelled to be part of the task. Following Jesus necessitates believing Jesus, and believing Jesus leads to proclaiming Jesus. Consequently, a privatized faith in a resurrected Christ is practically inconceivable. Yet privatized Christianity is a curse across our culture and church today. Wow. Pastor Skip Heitzig said this, Satan is always ready to rock the cradle of sleeping Christians. He sees that we as individuals, followers of Jesus Christ, start to wake up and go, you know what? The world is falling apart here. Jesus left me here to do this. He commanded me to make disciples of all nations. I need to get out of the cradle and get busy. And he kind of grabs that cradle spiritually and goes, shh, go back to sleep. You got a great life. You're happy. Why in the world would you mess it up by trying to do this? They're going to reject you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to make fun of you. Go back to sleep. That's what you pay your pastor for. And it's time in these last days we get out of the cradle and do what God left us here to do. So we're going to look at a biblical picture of how to make this eternal difference. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament was a man named Moses. He lived in a really nasty place called the desert. If you've ever been to a desert, you know it's not a nice place. You've got a lot of sand, you've got a plant over here, you've got a plant over here. And we have this awesome creative God who has a sense of humor. I mean, he made a donkey talk. And so instead of just sending an angel to flutter down and talk to Moses, what's he do? He creates the one and only butane bush. He's got this butane bush engulfed in flames. Moses looks over and sees it. Didn't see a man running off with a torch in his hand who just lit it. Didn't hear lightning crash. And he goes over to check this out. He's like, how in the world did this bush start on fire? Now he sees it's engulfed in flames, yet it's not being consumed by the flames. Well, that's incredibly unusual. And out of that burning butane bush, God speaks to Moses, and he says something really important. He said, Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And Moses starts to get excited. God says, I've heard them crying out, and I'm concerned about their suffering. And he's getting more and more excited. And then God says something that sends Moses into absolute elation. He says, so I have come down to rescue them. And Moses is jumping for joy. And God continues, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. So now go, I am sending you, Moses. At this point, Moses' elation bubble bursts. And he goes, whoa, hold on, Lord. I I know I heard you say you were coming down to rescue him. What's that got to do with me? God, you don't know me. I'm not the right person for this job. I stutter when I speak. I am not a leader. And he begged God multiple times to send someone else. And God said, no, Moses, I am coming down to rescue my people. So now go, I am sending you. I think it's really cool that the God of the universe, in most cases, 
chooses to use the regular people like us to accomplish great things for him. And the Bible says he never changes. So in the same way that back then he wanted to rescue his chosen people, the Jews, so he sent Moses to do it, he'd like to rescue some people in and around Ole, Pennsylvania, or wherever you happen to be watching on the internet, so he's going to send you folks to do it. God has seen all of the lost people in your life. Some are relatives, some are neighbors, some are coworkers, some are classmates, some are friends. They're people we meet at the doctor's office or at the gas station. And he's summoning each of us to join him in a rescue mission to save their lives. Christians are scared to death of the term witnessing. When they hear there's evangelism training in church on Saturday and they pick up their iPhone and look at their calendar and it's blank, they panic. And they call the dentist and beg for a root canal on Saturday so they have a valid excuse for not having to come to evangelism training because it's a lot less painful sitting in a chair than it will be to come here. So we're not going to use the term witnessing anymore. I'm going to change your thinking today. I want you to start to see yourself as a spiritual rescuer. And our theme today is going to be rescuing people for all of eternity. So this is an example of how not to do this. I am the world. I'm a Christian. Oh, what do you got there, Christian? Oh, this, this wouldn't interest you. No, I'm interested. No, no, trust me, this isn't your type of thing, all right? Try me. Look, I've seen it all before, okay? I know your types, you all living in your own little worlds, waiting for the next big indulgence, cranked up on sin, seething with fast car envy, curvy girl crazy, rolling over, sleeping over, and you're begging me to let you in on this little gym? <laughs> Think again, friend. This is the Bible, and it says you're not welcome here. Well, Christian, I have a Bible. <laughs> exactly, that's what I was trying... You, you have one of these? Everybody's got a Bible. It sits there right on the shelf at home. In fact, doesn't the main character in that book hang out with people like me? Oh, that's, that's, that's really funny. That, that's good. You, you, you're funny. You're a comedian. You should, you're a funny guy, Mr. Funny Guy. That, that's good. Doesn't he? I see where you're going with this, and I'm saying you're funny. That's really funny. You're a funny, funny guy. <laughs> I mean, doesn't he? Okay, well, yeah. Okay, agree to disagree. But you agreed with me. Right. Agree to disagree. I believe you call that double talk. Bit cheesy. My first official audience participation time. I need to know who the smart ones are in the room. Someone preferably who hasn't been through this. Who are you pointing at? Anybody over there? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Who here hasn't been through it on this side? Okay, thank you, ma'am. What's your name? Sherry. Sherry. Okay, Sherry, I'm going to set the stage for this. I've asked this over 400 times. Only 19 people got in on the question. That's not good news. Okay, the good news is I have three clues, and everybody can help unless you've been through this before. I know we have some veterans here. Okay, so Sherry, ready for your question? Okay, here it is. Who is Lenny Skutnik? That wasn't a look of positive. You don't know, okay. Yeah, I've had people say, wasn't he the guy that went into outer space? No, that was Sputnik. Um, did he have something to do with Laverne and Shirley? No, that was Lenny and Squiggy. Okay, here's your first clue, okay? Do you know where this is? No idea? It's not Florida. <laughs> okay, here's your second clue. Does that help? Third clue. It is January 13th, 1982. Ronald Reagan is president. Air Florida, Flight 90 is at National Airport in Washington, which is now Reagan International Airport, full of vacationers headed for Tampa. They're in a raging blizzard. Feet of snow have fallen on the D.C. area. They closed the airport, but they had one plane away from the gate, and they said, rather than try to drag it through the gate, let's get it out of here. So they de-iced the plane, but they de-iced the plane before they had finished clearing the runway. So while they waited for the runway to be cleared, more snow fell on the plane. The snow turned to ice. Snow built up on top of the ice. And when they finally took off up the normal flight path, which is up the Potomac River, the pilot and the co-pilot were pulling on the controls as hard as they could. The plane was shaking violently, and they couldn't get enough lift to clear the 14th Street Bridge. So they slammed in the bridge during rush hour, crushed a bunch of vehicles, killed a bunch of commuters who were on their way home from work. The plane went across the bridge, dropped onto the frozen Potomac, broke into three pieces, and sunk. Out of everyone on the plane, there were only six survivors. 
Four were female flight attendants. Two were male passengers. They bobbed to the surface between the chunks of ice in 33 degree water. Everyone who saw the plane crash, including Lenny Skutnik, got out of their cars, ran to the side of the river, ran to the side of the bridge to see what was happening. A short time later, the fire department showed up. They pulled inflatable boats out of the truck. They inflated the boats, dragged them down to the river, put them in the river, but the ice prevented them from getting out to the people, so they were stranded on shore helpless. A park police helicopter heard the Mayday call. They weren't equipped for rescue, but they thought, maybe we can help. They flew in, hovered over the tail section, lowered a rope to the man who was by the tail section of the plane. He unselfishly wrapped it around a female flight attendant, and they ferried her to shore. When they got to shore, the fire department tied a life ring on it, and they sent it back out. He helped another uh, flight attendant get into the life ring. In the meantime, there was a flight attendant named Priscilla. She had a severely broken left leg. She's laying on a slab of ice in total shock, just instinctively moving her arms like this, and here's what happened. Priscilla is their immediate priority. After 30 minutes in the freezing water, her chances of survival are on a knife edge. Lenny Skutnik is horrified as he watches from the shoreline. She was close enough where you could see the expression on her face. And her eyes just looked wild and she looked like she was going into shock then. Time and again, Priscilla slips from the life ring. Traumatized, exhausted, and temporarily blinded by aviation fuel, she begins to drown. Lenny realizes he can watch no more. It was just too much to take. I absolutely thought she was going to die if I didn't go in and get her. He jumps into the freezing water and drags Priscilla to safety. I believe it's a human instinct. I didn't weigh it or think about it, I just did it. Well, if it was a human instinct, why didn't we hear more splashes? It was just one guy. Now, that footage was shown on every TV station in America, and several weeks later, Ronald Reagan was giving the State of the Union address, and he did something that no U.S. president had ever done. Right in the middle of his speech, he stopped and he said, hey, how many of you saw that incredible rescue a couple of weeks ago where that government worker jumped in the Potomac River and saved that flight attendant's life when Air Florida Flight 90 crashed? And they all put their hands up and said, yeah, 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 we saw it. He said, well, probably most of you don't know who he is, so I've invited him here today. He's up in the gallery sitting next to my wife, Nancy. His name is Lenny Skutnik. Lenny, stand up. When Lenny stood up, Congress jumped to their feet. There's whistling and cheering and applause, and that started a tradition that continues today. Every U.S. president since Ronald Reagan and Lenny Skutnik will have everyday heroes in the gallery, and the president will tell their story and have them recognized by Congress. In fact, the name stuck. They call those everyday heroes recognized at the State of the Union address the Skutniks today. And so the reason we tell this story is because everyday people like Lenny Skutnik and like you and me can become a hero when we become a rescuer. How would like to be a hero in God's eyes? Here, well done, my good and faithful servant. It says in the last chapter of the book of Daniel, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Sounds like something we should all aspire to. So what I'd like you to do is think about some person who's in your life, friend, relative, coworker, neighbor, who you know isn't going to heaven, but you'd really like to take them with you. Just write their name down. I'm sure the Lord laid somebody on your heart. And from this point on, everything we do today is going to help equip you to rescue that person for eternity. So our presentation for today is four ways to rescue people for eternity. The first one is recognize why you are where you are. Recognize why you are where you are. In Connecticut, they got up and started dancing at the second one. It was interesting. Okay, and the second one. Um, Ma'am, where do you live? What street in town? Being you volunteered this group over here. Okay, what town? Robazoni, okay, why do you live there? Because you bought land there, good, good answer. Who here has a job? Anybody still work? Where do you work, ma'am? Where's that? Okay, and why do you work there? Because they hired you, good reason, yeah. Any public school students here? Where do you go to school? Brandywine Heights, why do you go there? Because your mom makes you. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Though. Okay, hobby, somebody has a hobby, what do you like to do? Anybody? Go ahead. What do you like to do? Draw. Draw. Okay, why? 
Good, awesome, yeah. There's nothing wrong with the answers to these questions, but when I finish point number one, if I were to ask the question again, we'd all give exactly the same answer. How's that possible? Let's go back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament was a woman named Esther. She was a what? Queen. She was also a Jew. There was a bad guy in the story whose name was Haman. Haman hated the Jews, was able to get a proclamation issued that was going to end up in the death of all the Jews. And he especially hated one Jew who wouldn't bow down to him. His name was Mordecai Wright. So Haman gets this word from the king, goes home for lunch, big party being thrown in his honor. He doesn't enjoy any of it. He's seething with anger. And he said, sorry, folks, I can't enjoy any of this as long as that guy, Mordecai, won't bow down to me when I walk by. And they, his loving family and friends come up with a loving solution. They said, Haman, if you hate the guy that much, hire a local contractor, have him install an eight-story high impaling pole on your front lawn. We'll grab Mordecai by his hands and feet. We'll carry him up to the top of the scaffold. On the count of three, we'll pick him up and we'll slam his body down in the impaling pole. Would that make your day? He goes, that would do it. So he hires a contractor. Mordecai gets wind about it. He's not terribly excited. He sends a note to his relative Esther and says, Esther, you are the queen of Persia. You've got to do something. This crazy guy, Haman, wants to kill all the Jews. That's us. And he's got this really bad plan for me. He wants to impale me on a pole in his front lawn. You've got to do something. She said, Mordecai, I would love to, but it's not that simple. You can't just stroll out in front of the king anytime you want. They've got guards there with swords and spears, and they're trained to run you through if you show up without being summoned by the king, and the king hasn't summoned me in 30 days. He said, well, this is life and death. What are we going to do? And she said, here's what I think we should do. Why don't we get all the Jews to fast and pray with us for three days? And at the end of three days, even if it means I'm going to die, I'll go see the king. So they do this, and at the end of three days, Esther puts on her royal robes, strolls out to the edge of the king's court, and I think her heart was going like this. Because it could be over like that. She steps out where the king can see her, and he says, Queen Esther, what a great surprise. Great to see you. Come up here, touch my golden scepter, sit on the throne next to me. Over a couple of days and some lunches, she's able to turn the tables on Haman so the Jews are rescued, and Haman gets impaled on his own impaling pole on his front lawn. How cool is that? And what does the Bible say about Esther? And who knows, Esther, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Difficult for us as human beings to comprehend an omniscient God who knows everything before it's going to happen. That's who the Bible says he is. Which means that even before he formed Adam and Eve, he knew his chosen people, the Jews, were going to be in serious danger because of a nutcase named Haman. So he had to strategically place a person in that place for that time to rescue them. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in the same way that back then, he put Esther in that position to save some lives, the application to you and me is we're just like Esther. He's divinely positioned each of us to save some lives. That's why you live where you live. That's why you work where you work, where you go to school, where you go to school, where you have the interests that you have, because God wants to use all of those things in our personal lives to connect us with people in hopes we're going to just invite them into the lifeboat and leave the results to him. And when you get this, your whole life changes. Let me illustrate. This is me and Pastor Ron and Jim. This is inside the Sphere of Death at the Harley Davidson Pavilion in Daytona Bike Week. The Sphere of Death is an iron cage. Three crazy guys on little motorcycles get in there and they ride like this. And they ride so fast they're a blur. And somehow they know when to change direction in the middle, which still freaks me out. And then they, they, they stop, and an even crazier dude walks in, and he stands in the middle like this, and they do it around him. I wasn't volunteering to do that. So we're in Daytona. Here's what I learned about Florida. We go to Florida at least once a year, sometimes twice a year to minister. They have the longest traffic lights on planet Earth. If you catch a light down there, they measure lights with calendars. Okay, they don't use watches. And if you catch a light, you can put it in park, go over to the store, grab yourself a cup of coffee, come on back, read the paper, finish your coffee. Maybe by then the light will change. So we catch this light. It's a four-lane road, bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. I'm in the right lane. Pastor Ron is next to me, next to the shoulder. And Jim is directly behind me. And I put the bike in neutral after I made sure I wasn't going to get rear-ended by somebody. And I'm just sitting there waiting for the light to change. And I look at the vehicle in front of me, and I notice it's a Ford Explorer. And its gas cap is hanging out, but they closed the door without screwing the cap in. So I thought for a second, put the bike in gear, pulled to the left, drove down the dotted line. And I stopped and I rapped on her window. Well, she didn't expect that. She kind of jumped and rolled the window out. She said, yes, can I help you? I said, ma'am, do you realize that your gas cap is hanging out? She said, no, I, I just filled up. I thought I screwed it in. I said, no, all you did was close the door. And I said, that's not going to keep the gas in the tank. And with the price of gas being what it is, it was $1.89 at the time. I thought you'd like to keep what you just paid for. I'm already out here. I'll be happy to screw it in for you. She said, that'd be great. So I backed the motorcycle up, 
open the door, screw the cap in, close the door, pull forward. She said, thank you so much. That was very kind. I said, no problem. When you die, do you want to go to heaven? And she looks at me and she goes, yeah, I do. I said, do you know how to get there? She said, no. I said, can I share with you how you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? She said, please tell me because I definitely want to go there when I die. Reached in my cargo pocket, pulled out a gospel of John with the plan of salvation in it. I invited her into the lifeboat and I said, look, you may get to read this whole thing before the light changes, but if not, will you take it home and read it when you get home? And she said, I promise I will because I definitely want to go to heaven when I die. Thank you so much. And I said, great, have a great day. I backed the motorcycle up and Pastor Ron is laying on his gas tank laughing. And he looks at me and he says, okay, Don, I saw you sharing the gospel of John with that woman. How did you start the conversation? And I said, Ron, she left her gas cap off. He said, wait a minute. He goes, what are the chances she's going to leave her gas cap off? That God's going to put you in the only place in traffic because I couldn't see it from where I was. And I asked Jim and he didn't see it. And no offense, Don, but you're going to be smart enough to use that as an open door to share your faith with this woman. I said, Ron, cool stuff like this happens to me all the time. He said, you see things I don't see. I said, listen, I just taught you last month. Okay, I've got a two-year head start on you. You just keep your eyes open. You're going to see stuff like this too. There are times when God will do amazing things to connect you with someone who is ready to listen if you are willing to share. He may even put a goat on your front porch. I, when I went to work in ministry at Family Life, I lived in what I call the middle of stinking nowhere. We were out, everybody thinks New York is Manhattan. No, this is rural New York. We had what were called central schools. A central school is kindergarten through 12 in the same building, about three to 400 students in 13 grades. Okay, so it's country. It was 45 minutes to the nearest grocery store or the nearest Walmart by highway. I could go in any direction, and in 45 minutes, I'm going to hit one of those two places. So once a week, my wife and I had date night to go grocery shopping. We came home from the ministry this one day, and uh, she said, Don, I know we're supposed to go grocery shopping today, but she says, I'm really not feeling good. Could we go tomorrow? I said, sure. I said, I'm sure there's something to eat in the refrigerator. She goes in the living room. I go into my office, and all of a sudden, I hear this, Don? I said, yeah, hon. She said, why is there a goat standing on our front porch looking in the window at me? And I'm like, whoa, she really isn't feeling well today. <laughs> And I go walking over, and this is what I see. So I grab a camera, snap a picture, and she said, please, you know how we live on Route 53, and the tractor trailers go whizzing down this road? I just know that that poor little goat's going to get smashed right in front of our house. It's going to be laid out on the lawn. We've got this nice A-frame, and it's all glass in the front with a view of the valley. And I'm going to see vultures coming down and landing on this thing and ripping it apart. I don't want to see that. You need to catch the goat. I'm like, sure, hon. Now, I wasn't raised on a farm, and I'm not a city kid, but I'm smart enough to know if it's got four legs, these two will never catch it unless I'm resourceful. But I'm an Eagle Scout. I figured, come on, I can outwit a goat. So I go down the basement, and I find a brand new coil of 100 feet of rope still wrapped up in the cellophane. I bring it upstairs, go out the door behind the goat, and she scampers down the steps and turns around and looks at me. So I drop the thing of rope. I cut it open. I'm making a little lasso. I'm like, come here, little goat, come here. And the goat's kind of inching its way in, trying to sniff my fingers to see what I have for it. And when she gets close enough, I whip the rope at it, hit it right in the head. Goat backs up. I did this three times. Same result every time. Now this goat has me figured out. This guy has nothing to eat. And every time I walk in, he whacks me in the head with something. I'm not walking in. I said, Kathy, get on the phone and call Carmen. Carmen was our next door neighbor so far away that you couldn't even see him. But he was raised on a farm in Shingle House, Pennsylvania. I figure he's got to know how to catch a goat. Well, Kathy gets his wife, Vicky, in the phone. She doesn't believe there's a goat on the porch. She hands the phone to Carmen. Carmen doesn't believe there's a goat on the porch. She says, here, Carmen, talk to Don. I grab the phone. I said, Carmen, just tell me how to catch a goat. He said, come on, Don, really? Is there a goat on your front porch? I said, well, not right now. She's standing on the front lawn looking at me. He said, okay, listen, I was raised on a farm. I know exactly what to do. Do exactly as I tell you to do. I said, okay, go ahead. He said, put a rope around her neck. <laughs> I said, it's not that easy. He said, I'll be over. So I go outside and I put my hand out. The goat's not interested. So I thought, okay, we're going to have to bait this goat in. I go inside, grab an apple, come out, cut a piece of apple, flip it out to the goat. She eats it through another chunk. I worked her all the way in until she's like right here. And I figured one more should do it. I'm going to go for it. And she plants her feet. She looks at the apple, looks up at me and goes, eh, and backs up. And I said, okay, that's it. I've had it. Went inside, made myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because now I'm getting hungry. And I come out. I take a chunk of apple, pitch it out to the goat. She's not interested. And I thought, what can I hurt? Maybe the goat likes peanut butter and jelly. Here's my tip of the day. If you ever need to catch a pygmy goat, just start with PB&J. They love it. I took a chunk of my sandwich, pitch it out to the goat. She ate it and walked right up to me. And all I did was hold the noose out, put the sandwich in the middle of the noose, and I went like this, and I had her. Now, as soon as the rope cinched around this little goat's neck, I learned something about this goat. 
She's never had a rope around her neck before. She didn't like the way it felt, and I think it kind of scared her, and she took off running on four legs as fast as she could run towards the highway. Do you know how fast they can run when they're scared? I am holding the end of a 100-foot piece of rope. She gets the end of the rope, her legs fly out from under, my shoulder goes like this, and she goes again and again. Carmen's walking over, doubled over laughing, and in church on Sunday, he said, till the day I die, folks, I will never forget the sight of this little goat trying to rip Don's shoulder right out of his body. And I reel her in, he says, Don, that's an auction tag from the bath auction. The auction was yesterday, that goat must have fallen off a truck, looks like you got yourself a pet. I said, no, I don't. Carmen, look around my front lawn. I don't know how long she's been here for, but she's left little piles of brown presents all over the lawn. She's not staying. He said, what are you going to do? I said, hold her. I'm calling the cops. I called the state police. I called the sheriff. I called the SPCA. Nobody knew anything about it. And I, and I came back out. He said, how'd you make out? I said, not good. And he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, we can't let her go. She belongs to somebody. I said, there's a doghouse out back from the previous owner. I know there's a cable and a clip there. I've got a little dog collar in a basement from our dog, Prince. We can put the collar on the goat, clip her to the run, give her a bowl of water and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. She'll be set for a little while. So we do this. She immediately goes in the doghouse and lays down. And Carmen says, see, she's already made herself at home. I said, Carmen, she isn't staying. Vicky hasn't said a word. She's heard all kinds of stories about me sharing my faith. And she just stands there like this and she says, so Don, I'm still trying to figure out who you're going to get to share Jesus with as a result of this goat being on your porch. I said, Vicki, I don't know because we have no idea who the owner is. A few minutes later, the phone rings. It's the state police. Some woman called and reported their goat missing. They give her my phone number. She calls me and, she's, and, she, and I give her directions to the house. And she said, Don, we live on the other side of the valley. We bought this goat for my two little boys last night at the bath auction put it in a totally enclosed pen last night at 8.30. The kids hugged and kissed the goat goodnight. We put them to bed. My husband and I checked the goat at 11. She had already disappeared. We have no idea how she got out, but we're going to rename her Houdini. Could we come and get her now? I said, come on and get her now. I'll give you directions. She comes up, and we have this conversation. She said, I can't believe that this goat got out, didn't get eaten by coyotes in the wilderness, and why out of all the places on planet Earth for it to go would it come and stand on your front porch and wait for you to come home from work? I said, it's really easy to explain. God led your goat right to my front porch. She said, why would God do that? I said, because he wants me to share something with you. Can I share something with you? She says, yeah, now I'm dying to find out what it is. Reached in my cargo pocket, pulled out a gospel of John with the plan of salvation in it, invited her into the lifeboat, invited her to church. Here's what I want, the point I want to make. We miss this 99 or 100% of the time. I believe that every person that you meet in this life has been handpicked by God in hopes that that little connection, when you meet them, you're going to use to just invite them to go to heaven and leave the results to God. And when you get this in your head, your daily life becomes a great adventure. Who here has had a cool title or won an award for something? Go ahead, what'd you have? A trophy for what? Soccer, all right, I'm a soccer official. Don't hold that against me. Okay, yeah, you know what's really cool? When you get a um, God, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, God gives you a really cool title. And it's not just a cool title, it's the most important title on planet Earth. It even trumps President of the United States because it has eternal significance. And you don't only get the title, but you get all the responsibility that comes along with it. And the title is Ambassador for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something about this title. It is a full-time job. Yet most followers of Christ don't even do it part-time. And it's such an important job that someday every true follower of Christ will stand before him at a place called the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to give us a lifetime performance review for how good of a job we did as his ambassadors. Now what if Jesus were to surprise us all today, and walk in here and say, hey, I'm going to see you all at the judgment seat of Christ, but for today, I'd like to give you a performance review for the first nine months of 2014 to see if I want to keep you employed for the last quarter of this year, which is a big quarter for us. How many of us would survive the performance review? <laughs> okay, it's a full-time job that most of us don't even do part-time. And if we're doing it even part-time, and you walk out of your house, you're going to have a testimony every single day, which means on Sunday you're going to have at least seven testimonies if there's an opportunity to share them. Now, notice the scripture says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. It doesn't say my pastor is Christ's ambassador. Missionaries are Christ's ambassadors. People in vocational Christian service. 
It says we. Anybody who puts their hand up and says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, gets the title and all the responsibilities that go along with it. Now, an ambassador is someone assigned by the highest authority there is to represent him in a specific place. We are assigned as full-time ambassadors of Jesus Christ to represent him where we live, where we work, in school, uh, at the gas pump, in the doctor's office, or when God puts a goat on our front porch. Wherever it happens to be, we are there to represent him. Did you ever notice that healthy things grow? Healthy plants grow. My, we were, before I got called into ministry, my wife was working for this Christian chiropractic couple up in Covington, Pennsylvania. And uh, at, right before Christmas, they gave her a nice healthy bonus check, and they gave her a beautiful poinsettia plant. Well, she isn't into plants, and we had a really nice log home on the side of a mountain, and the back uh, bay window there is where I kept all my plants. And my routine was on Sundays, I would go water the plants and pull any dead leaves off and throw them out. April 25th rolls around. It's a Sunday morning. I go over to water my plants and pull the leaves off, and I notice this poinsettia plant, and I go, you know what? Why hasn't this plant lost any leaves? And I go and check it a little further, found out it was a fake plant that I had been watering for four and a half months. I went in and told her she about had a heart attack. She was laughing so hard. She goes, you didn't know? I said, you put it in the window with the real plants. How was I supposed to know? I thought I was supposed to take care of it. So anyway, healthy plants grow. Healthy animals grow. Little dogs become big dogs. Puppies become dogs. Kittens become cats. Healthy people grow. And here's the last one. Healthy churches grow. If the church isn't growing, there's something fundamentally wrong with, the, with the, the health of the church. And it's not the pastor's fault. The pastor's job is to equip the church, the body of Christ, to do the work of ministry, not to do all the work of ministry. Now, sadly, a lot of church growth in America today is, is measured by what I call sheep trading. We're going to move sheep from this flock to this flock. They don't like what the pastor said last week. They changed their music. So we're going to come here and we got church growth. That is not church growth. That's sheep trading, okay? And shepherds don't make sheep. Sheep make sheep. And it's our job as the sheep of the flock to be reproducing on a regular basis. And that's the sign of a healthy church, that people are doing what God left us here to do. So what is your connection to people? You've heard some of these kind of off-the-wall connections that I've had with people over time. Let me introduce you to my friend Charlie York. Charlie York is a retired first sergeant from the Marine Corps. Uh, believe it or not, he was Sergeant York in the Marines. Now, young people don't have any idea what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Um, Charlie came up to me, took my training four times, and he said, Don, my friend Dave and I have been through your training a bunch of times. We love motorcycles the way you like motorcycles. We've never used in that God-given interest for him. We'd like to go to Daytona Bike Week with you to share Christ with the bikers. Can we come? I said, yeah, come on along. So I took this picture inside the Daytona International Speedway. Before we went into the speedway, this was taken two years ago, I believe, uh, we were outside in the vendor area. There's lots of tents, and you walk up and down the rows of tents and look at what people are selling. And Charlie saw a vendor selling patches, and he bought this U.S. Marine Corps rocker patch. He put his first sergeant's pin above it and a couple of ribbons, a couple of other things on his vest. Those things added to a vest opened up more doors of ministry for this man than I've ever seen in my life. The guy who bought the patch from him said, First Sergeant, I can sew it on for you right here and now. So Charlie took his vest off. The guy sewed the patch on. We're walking through the vendor area, and this vendor sees Charlie walk by, notices the patch and the pin, and says, Hey, First Sergeant, you have a good day today. That was the connection. Charlie walks up to this guy, has a conversation with him, ends up sharing the gospel with him, gives him a gospel of John with the plan of salvation in it to read, lays hands on the guy and prays for him. We leave. That night, we're at the, the apartment that we were staying in. We had nine guys crammed in this uh, ministry apartment. And his friend Dave says, Don, when we were down at the Speedway yesterday, I saw an accessory I'd like to have put on my bike. Could we go down there tomorrow morning and have it put on? I said, sure, we'll go first thing in the morning so there's no lines, we can be done, and we'll do whatever we want to do for the rest of the day. We go past the vendor that Charlie ministered to the day before. And Charlie, he sees Charlie and goes, hey, First Sergeant, good to see you again today. Charlie walks over and sees that Gospel of John laying on the table exactly where the guy put it down the day before. He gets toe-to-toe -to -toe with that guy, nose-to-nose, -nose, and says, Sergeant, I have a question for you. He says, yes, sir. He said, yesterday, you told me you were going to read this Gospel of John. I noticed it's laying exactly where you put it down yesterday. Did you or did you not read it? 
He said, no, sir, I didn't read it. Charlie says, are you a man of integrity? He said, yes, sir, I am. Charlie yanks the sunglasses off of his face, says, look me in the eyes and tell me you're a man of integrity. He said, sir, I'm a man of integrity, sir. He said, look me in the eyes and tell me that tonight, before your head hits the pillow, you'll read this cover to cover. He said, sorry, I will, sir. And Charlie slaps the sunglasses back on his face, says, I expect you'll be a man of your word. Have a good day. And I'm walking away going, whoa. I grabbed him. I said, man, I didn't teach you to do that. He said, more Marines. He can take it. We go to breakfast at this restaurant in Holly Hill. It's called the Hungry Heifer. Kind of a cow theme. Charlie's at one table. I'm at a different table. We're going to talk after lunch about how to pray for your servers in restaurants. Okay? Tremendous opportunities to minister. He prays for his server. I pray for my server. We are walking out of the restaurant. This big dude with a Marine Corps hat on and his wife is walking in. He said, first sergeant, you be careful on that motorcycle today. Connection. I wish I brought my phone in with me. They go to a table for two and sit down. Charlie walks over and kneels down on the hard tile floor on both knees, pulls out this Gospel of John and starts inviting these two people to go to heaven with him. At the end he says, I'd like to pray for each of you. He said, how can I pray for you and what are your names? Now there wasn't one person in the restaurant that wasn't watching this. The servers were holding plates and they stopped and they watched this. Charlie wraps his arms around these two people he just met, and he starts to pray, and the woman starts crying. She cries through the whole prayer. He says, in Jesus' name, amen. He gets up, and the big guy gets up and hugs him, tells him to have a good day and be careful. She gets up, hugs her. She cries on his shoulder a little bit. We start to leave, and two guys at a table said, first sergeant, have a good day today. He stopped and talked to them. We were there. It happened five times. We were there for almost two and a half hours. And Dave pokes me. He goes, Don, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. I said, Dave, these aren't our divine appointments. They're his. Apparently, this is a target-rich environment for retired Marines. All we can do is just pray for Charlie and wait for our opportunities. And so based, the reason I tell this story is a great illustration. Based on your interests, based on your position in life, based on your background, there are certain kinds of people that are going to listen to you because they're your connections that aren't going to listen to me, and they're not going to listen to your pastor. So who are some of these types of people that might listen to someone like you? Okay, soccer players will listen to other soccer players. Guys who ride motorcycles will listen to other motorcycle riders. Policemen will listen to other policemen. Teachers will listen to other teachers. So you're going to fill in these blanks differently depending upon who you think you might connect with. Paul said, when I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find some common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. When you have the common ground, it's an opportunity to share with somebody. So who remembers some stuff they took to show and tell? I know that goes way back for some of us. Anybody? Go ahead. What'd you bring? A chicken. A, chicken. a full-grown chicken. How'd that go? It went fine. Yeah, that's cool. I had a guy in South Carolina pick up a bear cub in his backyard. I mean, unbelievable. I had a lady in Alma, New York, sitting over here, she said, I brought a cattail. I said, you kind of find it in a swamp. She goes, no, I mean a real cattail. <laughs> well, there's all kinds of moaning and groaning. I said, sorry, folks, can't let this one go. Where did you get a real cattail? She said, well, it was severed from our cat one morning when my dad started his truck. I said, what did it look like? She said, straight up in the air, a little curve at the top. The fur was out in all directions. It was really stiff, and you could hold it by the end. It used to be attached to the cat. I said, did it smell? She said, not really. I said, I had to go over in school. She went, whoa, not well. <laughs> So here's the thing, if you remember anything from school, you remember that if you have a two-part assignment and you only choose to do one of the two parts, you typically get a 50, which is an F. The same thing is true here. To be a successful spiritual rescuer, I have two assignments for you. The first one is you have to show. What do I mean when I say you have to show? You need to show people you are different because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've had an eternity-changing encounter with the living God, you were born again, that God gives you a new heart and a new spirit, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells you, you are different. Some people have dramatic changes, like they're healed of alcoholism, drug addiction. That's not most of our stories. Most of our stories are a gradual change that happens over time, but there needs to be something different about us. Followers of Christ are new creations born from above and changed from within with values and lifestyles that confront the world and clash with accepted morals. True believers don't blend in very well. 
We are to be different. We are not to blend in with the world, where we live, where we work, where we go to school, with our friends. God wants people who are bold, unashamed followers. We are called to be salt and light. Salt penetrates meat, it flavors it, and preserves it. When salt and meat interact, the meat is changed forever. Light penetrates darkness. We've got a beautiful sunny day out here. Take your flashlight outside, shine it on the sidewalk. You're not going to see it. Take that same light into a room with no windows or lights, and it illuminates the whole dark room. Guess what? If you look at what's going on around us and your head isn't in the sand, our world is getting darker and darker every day. So that light of Jesus Christ should be shining brighter because it's getting darker. God wants, doesn't, isn't interested in having closet Christians as followers or what I call secret agent Christians. He wants people who are just going to live out their Christianity in front of people because it's going to give you an opportunity to share with them why you're different. And if you are not different from the world, you better examine yourself to be sure you're really in the faith because something could be terribly wrong. David Platt said, if you are truly a disciple of Jesus, you will be supernaturally compelled to make disciples of Jesus. Does that scare you? Boy, that scared me when I read it. I started looking at people in my life going, hmm, I wonder if they're really okay. I know what they profess, but are they supernaturally compelled to make disciples of all nations? True followers of Jesus do not need to be convinced, cajoled, persuaded, or manipulated in making disciples of all nations because everyone who follows Jesus biblically will fish for men globally. Wow. James McDonald said, if your faith hasn't changed you, then your faith hasn't saved you. Very great statement, absolutely biblically accurate. You can't have an encounter with the living God where you don't walk away different when you make a decision for Christ. And so if Christians make no effort to affect the world around them, they're of little value to God. If we are too much like the world, we are worthless. Christians should not blend in with everyone else. Instead, we should affect others positively just as seasoning brings out the best flavor in food. Mark Cahill said this. This is terribly convicting. He said an unexceptional standard run-of-the-mill life for someone who follows Jesus Christ is not acceptable to him and should not be acceptable to who you see in the mirror each day. Wow. So, what change in me would be noticeable and meaningful to all of the lost people who are in my life? Family, work, school, people I hang out with. How about language? I was a police officer who didn't curse or swear. You don't think I stuck out like a sore thumb? Those guys can't get through three or four sentences without throwing the F-bomb out. And when you don't talk that way, they recognize it really quickly. They'll even apologize when they swear in front of you. You know, ladies, dress modestly. The Bible calls you to do that. Guys have enough trouble controlling their hormones. You know, don't encourage them by dressing provocatively. Maybe your neighbor's wife is going in the hospital for some surgery. She's going to be in for three days or something, which is, I guess, a long time today. Um, you know, this guy can't boil water, so you grab some ladies from church. You say, come on, we're going to go pray for this lady before she goes in church. We're going to lay hands on her, pray for her, and we're going to offer to make meals for the family every night, find out what they like to eat. The average person isn't going to do that. Stop at the side of the road and help somebody when he pops the hood up in his car. Offer to give him a ride or get gas, whatever it is he needs. These are things that the world probably isn't going to do, but we can do to show people we're different. And the second part of this is we've got to tell them why we're different. You know, they're not going to put two and two together and get four. They're not going to say, that Don Sunshine is a really nice guy. I bet Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Those two things won't go together, okay? Now, if you were driving down the road and you're crossing a ravine on a big bridge on a curve, okay, deep, deep ravine, you get across the bridge on a solid ground, and all of a sudden you hear this rumble and crunch, and you look in your rearview mirror, and you see the bridge kind of fold and drop. The first thing you do is say, whoa, Lord, that was really close, but thank you for saving me. And then you see a stream of cars coming the other way in the distance, and they're coming around this blind curve. Is there any person in this room who would have to think twice about stopping the car, getting out and standing on the road and going like this? Would we hesitate to do that? Would we be embarrassed to do that? No, you're not going to watch them go by and say, whoa, that one went pretty far. Oh, yeah, that one probably landed right on top of the first one. You just watch them go by? No, we're going to do that. Why? Because they're headed for a physical death. Why is it we would, without hesitation, without embarrassment, without fear, stop our cars and stand in the middle of the road and flag somebody down when they're headed for a physical death, but we're not willing to say one word to the people who we supposedly care about that are in our lives that are on autopilot headed for hell going right past us. You know, there's something wrong with that picture. If the world believes in, in a God, 
They feel like they got to earn their way to heaven because that's what religion is all about. It's do, do, do when the work has already been done. And what we need to tell them is you can't get there the way you're going. The bridge you're trying to build is out. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Is that narrow-minded? Yeah. Politically incorrect? Yeah. Uh, really unpopular? Yes. And only getting worse. Scripture says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those who are staggering towards slaughter. Let me tell you something. If you really believe that the people in your life are staggering towards an eternal slaughter, you're going to, without hesitation, throw your arms around their legs spiritually and say, drag me. I care too much about you. I don't want to let you go. Scripture also says, snatch others from the fire and save them. You all know